Hello to everyone. It's good to see some uh, familiar names and faces and also some that are less familiar. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased to be uh, here this morning. Um, as we begin, could I just call us to a, a brief time of reflection and uh, prayer? So, so uh, could I invite you just to um, maybe if you want to close your eyes, now would be the time to do it, but don't have to do that. But let's just take a nice, long, slow, deep breath as we begin. And as we breathe in another time in a long, slow way, let's remind ourselves of the breath of God in the Genesis 2 story being breathed into the first human being. And as we take a nice a third long, slow, deep breath, let's remind ourselves of Jesus breathing upon the first disciples after the resurrection, saying, peace be with you. And can I invite us to open our eyes if they're closed and have a look at the faces on the screen as far as you're able or the names at the very least. And as we look, let's remind ourselves that each person we see and can see the name of is a God breathed person. And that God's breath may be in our conversation. And any one of us may be the carrier, the vehicle of God's communication to any other, any one of us in the room. And that's because uh, I particularly want to uh, invite us to reflect on that because in a sense, we're gonna co-create this session um, I'm going to say some, a bunch of stuff, some of which may be quite uh, need a bit of unpacking, and that will be what uh, breakout rooms, rooms will be for uh, to identify where that needs to happen. Uh, but I think I'll probably be talking for something like 20, maybe a bit longer if I get into it, uh, minutes. So uh, I'm going to uh, want to uh, get us to think about creation and human beings within creation and a pattern of creation that actually as Christians, perhaps we don't think about so often. Um, I want to think about that in reflection to uh, things like the council of God's imagery within the Old Testament, but also the uh, imagery in the New Testament about that's often summarized as principalities and powers, but there's a lot more words used than that. And so I wanna bring those into our reflection. I want to bring a little bit of uh, science into understanding some of that. Um, and I want us to think a little bit about co-creation and the powers that be, as it were, in terms of co-creation uh, in God's uh, kind of scheme of things. And uh, what I'm hoping to do, uh, what I, I, full disclosure, if you like, here, is that I'm still thinking through some of this thing. I've been thinking about the powers and principalities thing for a number of years, and I even have a little book published on the matter ages ago, and I, don't, I stand by a lot of it, but not all of it now. Um, but uh, it's bringing it together with this idea of co-creation and the uh, council of gods and all of that stuff that's a bit new, and I'm still kind of thinking that through. So this is a bit of a, an attempt to... Uh, see how it flies with other people and run it through some other minds to see whether uh, it uh, can make coherent sense. So that's the co-creation that I hope we're all going to be involved in, uh, in in all of this. So do feel free to uh, surface your puzzlements about what I say or the, the need to say further things uh, at some point. Um, so I hope that's uh, enough of, by way of putting things together. What 
follows maybe feel a little bit of a hodgepodge. I hope it doesn't, but it might do. So I'm just warning <laughs> that that's the case. Uh, and I'd like to start with something about creation and particularly uh, to do with uh, human beings. Uh, the, the creation account in Genesis 2, uh, which I referenced in that meditation prayer time at the start, it is, uh, I think, really intriguing because uh, right in the middle of that, verse 15, if I remember correctly, of chapter 2 of Genesis, uh, it, we're told it is not good that the human being should be alone. And then there's that whole thing with uh, bringing the animals and eventually that culminates in the creation of a helpmeet, uh, as uh, some versions translated it. Uh, but one of the things that this says to me is that is that not good to be alone thing is a comment, among other things, on the fact that we are created as social beings. We are fashioned as social beings. We're interconnected. And uh, uh, so keep that in mind there's you know the, the foundation there in, in human beings being uh, purposed by god to be interactive and social and to be collaborating working together with one another the, the task of tending the garden is meant to be is the uh, kind of impetus for for this little scene in the genesis account anyway so keep that in mind uh, what i'd like to bring to that in addition to that then is uh, something about the way that in Genesis 1 which is the the other major account that we start with uh, that of uh, teeming life and of things being told to reproduce and flourish and uh, and you know just kind of yeah be really really themselves and filling the earth and multiplying and just being a rich rich creation um, and amongst that we we realize taken taking that together with the social thing there we realize that some of that creation is of uh is done in certain ways that things come together they're not just discrete units but things act together we know this uh study of ecology is all about exploring what that means but let's uh, just think a little bit about the what we know from scientific study about some of that creation. Um, we know that, for example, that some point quite a long time ago in Earth's history, um, different kinds of life combined together to form a new kind of cellular life, and they started cooperating together. Eukaryotic cells, which we're made of mostly, uh, came about as that and they've they've then not only collaborated as individual cells the individual components of those cells but those cells learned to collaborate with one another and to diversify and to differentiate themselves uh, and the result of that is there are multi-celled creatures like ourselves with brains that's quite amazing in terms of the way that they collaborate together using electrochemical signals and so on so um there's this phenomenon within the created order that uh, some scientists call emergence. Some of you may have heard of it, some of you may not. But the idea is that something emerges from the interactions of whatever at one level, and their interactions are of a sufficient kind of complexity and character that uh, what emerges from that interaction is a higher level being, a higher level of being, higher level being. Um, and so I want us to pay attention to, to that particular thing, that our sociability is rooted in something creational, and it's uh, that creational thing, emergence, if we want to, if we're happy to use that term, uh, is the basis for complex life, for the kind of, uh, kind of ability to do what we're doing now, which is to exchange thoughts uh, and so on. Um, which is quite a, a, an order above just mere, if you like, electrochemical reactions looked at on their own. There's something amazingly complex and uh, distinct going on at this new, new emergent level uh, of being a human. And um, what I want to get us to pay attention to is perhaps the idea is that it doesn't just stop with us as individual human beings. 
the creational tra trajectory is about working together, collaboration, things, uh, even working very, very closely together. So they, they become enmeshed in one another to make a body, for example. What if that's the case for human beings? Perhaps there is something about us as human beings that is uh, going towards, but not quite uh, the same order as a bee colony or an ant's nest, where you have a bunch of creatures, which it, it almost doesn't quite make sense to think of an ant or a hive bee as uh, a creature on its own. It makes a lot of sense to think about bees and ants and termites and creatures like that in the collective because that's the level of analysis that really is very helpful uh, and perhaps makes more sense that they don't reproduce as individuals, they reproduce as a colony, for example. Um, so it, there's a queen that does that, but that can't happen. A queen on her own cannot, cannot produce all of that. It needs the whole, whole nest or colony or hive to do that. So I want to suggest that we might think of ourselves as having a potential for something of that collectivity. It's not full. Uh, it's not a full collectivity. We're not uh, in such a way that we uh, are tied forever to our hive. Although there are some interesting science fiction novels that uh, postulate that that uh, that would be a diversion at the moment. Um, but we are capable of quite a lot of the things of diversifying and collecting together our labor and our thinking to make things that as individuals and to do things that as individuals we could not do. And I would suggest that that is kind of implicit in the Genesis 2.15 thing about it not being good that a human being is alone. That part of God's purpose in that is that we should collaborate together and create conditions for for further creation, and that we are called to create together uh, more than what we started with. Um, so I'm hoping that's making enough sense just at the moment. Uh, so that, what I'm saying is that emergence uh, out, overflows our individual humanity uh, into a collective humanity, which is purposed under God to uh, to create th further things in God's purposes, uh, like human societies. Uh, in my own thinking on this, I tend to call this uh, pulling together of uh, human human individual bodies into collective bodies. I, I've been calling using the term corporizations, and I may just knock that in it's the idea of, of collecting together bodies to make a, a bigger thing a bigger body out of that corporization but it uh, encompasses uh thing, terms such as organizations corporate uh corporate um, corporations uh institutions uh, uh in terms of the human sciences and i'm also going to suggest that powers principalities and so on structures uh, are also part of what's meant by that. And I'll, I'll unpack, I hope, a bit of that as we go on. Um, I think that in God's purposes, that love and justice are meant to be one of the main glues for, uh, for these human co uh, corporizations, if you like. Um, but uh, there are other things as well, and the social sciences help us to uh, think about uh, those things. Some of you may be aware that Walter Wink, uh, the theologian who died uh, a dozen or more years ago, I think now, uh, wrote a, book, a series of books uh, on the theme of the powers. And then he wrote a fourth book, which was kind of uh, doing a quick uh, recap of a lot of that. Um, and he picks up this kind of theme. I've come at it from a different angle to him. He, he doesn't talk about emergence but I think that's, if you like, the missing thing from his account. Um, but he talks about the powers um, and a whole host of other terms that the New Testament tends to use uh, in terms of being both spiritual and physical uh, and having a, a, a dimension that has a foot in both of those camps and that we, we are advised to, when we come across that language in the New Testament, to think about it uh, 
to, to think both of the possibility of it meaning something that's like a human structure or governance or something like that, and or um, a spiritual dynamic at operation uh, in the world and particularly within the human world. Uh, and uh, so that that's Walter Wink's main thesis, I think, uh, in this. And so he he offers that reading of that part of the New Testament as a way of thinking about human act, political, for example, action, uh, and recognizing that uh, that it is uh, political action by Christians is a spiritual thing because it involves these powers, um, and uh, but it also involves us in thinking about how how they actually work and the kinds of actions that we need to take to. And this is the other thing I think that he very helpfully points out to us, that call them back to their vocation. He makes the case that under God, these corporizations, these principalities, powers, structures, institutions, organizations, and all of that are purposed by God for, I think he actually says human welfare. I think, particularly in the context that we're thinking today, that actually we need to include the fifth mark of mission uh, in, in that and think about actually these powers are purposed for the uh, well-being of the created order in fact and not just human beings don't think Walter Wink would have argued with that but I don't think he actually says that uh, unless I've missed it somewhere uh, so uh, these powers these corporizations organizations institutions whatever they are made of us they're made out of us but they exceed us they have their own identities and their own callings, um, but we provide the context for them to exist, the energy that sustains them, uh, the characteristics that make them up. Uh, and yeah, so they're made of us and we bring a lot into that, but they are more than us. And a lot of us uh, recognize this, that somehow uh, human organizations often have what we might say describe as a life of their own or they they have purposes that uh, seem to escape us because they seem to be more than what uh, human beings within them intend uh, and they seem to be uh, sometimes recalcitrant to uh, when it comes to our trying to shape them uh, because of that their, their own kind of uh, life as it were and i would say that that, that is actually uh, part of the the model of creation that uh, God has made, this this I, this trajectory of emergence that we that we find is set up as I think just as a part of the way that God has made everything. Um, so that's I hope that makes enough sense, but we can explore a bit later on uh, a bit more. So what else do I want to say? Um, lately, I've started. Uh, reading the Hebrew scriptures much more uh, than I ever used to. And I got really curious about the terminology to do with the Council of the Gods. Um, and I think actually the Council of the Gods may be well, that, that kind of imagery where that turns up may well be uh, interpreted in a way that's consonant with what uh, Wink and others uh, have been in encouraging us to do. Um, and so uh, I'd invite us to, when we come across that kind of language or imagery uh, within the Hebrew scriptures, we might like to think about whether this idea of them, uh, this being uh, something which has a, a dual nature of being both earthly and heavenly fits. Largely, I, I think I've been finding that it does. Um, so I, th I think uh, that language in the New Testament does rest on an understanding that the ancient, a lot of people in the ancient world probably had, at least implicitly, that when they were talking about gods, and incidentally, the, the, the words are a bit fluid in Hebrew, and uh, the interpreter, the translators do take a bit of a punt on the translation occasionally. Uh, and uh, so when, uh, when we're seeing that, that we might think about uh, a situation where the king and priests are being seen as, as the earthly face of, if you like, the nation's 
genius, if I could use a Ro uh, Latin Roman sort of term, spiritual dimension of that, uh, that nation. But it's made up of, of everything that that nation is, its wealth, its people, its rulers, uh, and, and its relationships indeed with, with the environment and with other nations and so on. So it has its own identity, uh, and that the councils of the council of the gods is is a way of saying that that, that identity is held before God in some way. Um, so, so a note on the kind of translation thing there: often the word Elohim is used, which is the regular word for God or a regular word for for God with a capital G, as we have it in the Hebrew Scriptures. But that very word sometimes is translated as angel or angels. Uh, as well as God's plural, um, and sometimes even seems to refer to human rulers. So, as I say, it's, uh, it does need a little bit of looking at sometimes. So, I would say that maybe the Old Testament picture here is that each nation is corporately present at a spiritual level uh, in the council of God um, or council of the gods. Um, and the Elohim, the, uh, the gods, are uh, the nations seen in spirit space, pneuma space. That's the space that's created by human social emergence uh, and picks up on things like culture, economics, politics, and religion. Um, and I think that's you know, an early stage of human social development at one level. I think now to that picture, we might want to consider adding major corporations, for example, to the Council uh, council of the Gods, if we wanted to retain that, that uh, kind of imagery as a way of thinking about things. Um, so I did in the uh, kind of uh, what, what we're going to talk about uh, part of things mentioned at one point, um, Martin Luther King and the quote he picked up actually from somebody else, but uh, and made it to serve his purpose, that the, uh, uh, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things we might be thinking, want to think about is the idea that human co-creation through these corporizations, these institutions and so on, that, that we almost without thinking about it create, um, are purposed for, uh, by God for justice, among other things. Human flourishing will involve justice. So that's the link I want to make there, is, that, is the sense that God's creation is ongoing, and part of that ongoing creation is to do with these these corporate beings that are made out of human beings. And God's purpose in there is that these things should, uh, should create justice and create the conditions for human flourishing, justice being part of that. Um, moral, as in moral universe, is an anthropocentric term, I think. Um, and so if we think that there might be some truth to what I've just said, uh, it would be expressed through the ongoing co-creation of things through and in these corporizations. Continuing creation, which includes making justice, making love, making human and planetary flourishing. And I think, but this is where, this is very much the edge of where I'm thinking at the moment. I think this relates to the Logos thing in John chapter one, verse one and following. I think uh, the logos uh, is a way of thinking about the imminence of God in these structures. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's, there's already a kind of incarnational theme in that. But as I say, I'm, I've only just started really thinking about that. So if you've got further thoughts that may move that a bit further forward, I'd be very happy to hear them. So uh, I mostly said, what uh, I, I think I need to say by way of, <laughs> as it were, introduction. Um, I think there are some implications, uh, and you may have other ones. I think this way, of, uh, uh, this way of looking at things helps us to appreciate and perhaps understand better how complicity works. If we are part of these things and we make them up, then I think there's something to be explored there about complicity. 
for instance, in climate change. Um, our collaboration, our technology, our ideas, our values, our spiritualities, uh, as well as feedback from them to us more individual, individually are, are what these corporations are made of. So it's thinking about the way those things mutually inform each other and how those uh, corporations shape us as well as we shape them. I think that's an area for exploration. Um, we are alerted to the idea that these corporations have God-given vocations and we need to find ways to help call them back to their vocations, which would be in the context of helping life to thrive and serving well-being, including human well-being. Um, and I think that's the task of people like Christian Climate Action. Uh, I think that's that's very much uh, where where the kind of uh, protest and uh, and so on is. About, but that's where it's located. Um, I think that implies that we need to find effective ways to communicate with them, these corporations. And that is indeed where protest and disruption can come in. But I think we should be asking each time, how does whatever, whatever we're planning to do or whatever, communicate and how does it, it help recall this institution, this organization, this corp corporation back to its vocation? And indeed, what might its vocation be that we're calling it back to. I believe that's the work of the spirit that we're called to cooperate with. And that's also ongoing, you know, co-creation, if you like, with God. Um, and I think the other implication, of course, is, as I hope you've been picking up from what I've been saying, the scriptures already tell us about this, but a lot of it's been hidden from us because of the way the context have changed and uh, thought frames that we use to read the scriptures are not any longer the same as they were when they were originally written and all of that kind of thing. Um, so, but we see, I think we see some of this under the imagery of apocalyptic and prophetic, prophetic and mythological uh, discourse within the Bible. Um, there's also a different set of governance assumptions about how societies are run. We don't largely live in absolute monarchies any longer. Um, and so there is something in there about the way we read, uh, having a background now where some value for democracy and social justice is is much more uh, present. Um, so I'm going to stop talking there in just a moment, but I want to read to you a prayer. Uh, it goes like this. In a world replete with prideful and greedy powers, shaping the lives of people and planet, bring them to judgment, Recall them to the common good and draw them into creation care. God, fulfill your purpose for us. Send from heaven and save us. And that's uh, a petition from a set of daily prayers that uh, I've been working on over the last uh, handful of years. Uh, which hold climate change as part of their regular uh, structure. So, um, as I say, that's uh, pretty much what I felt I needed to be setting us off with. It has taken about half an hour. Um, so uh, I'm just seeing the questions there. I'm sorry that I've not been able to attend to that while I've been uh, 